This is part one of a presentation on Much Ado About Nothing. And in these two presentations, I'm just going to give you an overview of some of the major ideas, key points, characters, plot points, etc. in the play. Let's begin by considering the title, which, because of Shakespeare's play, has become something itself of a cliché or common expression, an idiomatic expression. Much ado about nothing, much to do about nothing, essentially means a lot of fuss, a lot of busyness, a lot of worry about something that doesn't warrant that much worry, about nothing important. Another phrase we might say is making a mountain out of a molehill or a tempest in a teapot, a big deal where there doesn't need to be a big deal. Of course, we also say, we also talk about someone who does this, we say they're very dramatic. They like drama. And of course, that's what Shakespeare's doing. He is a dramatist. So in a sense, is this a comment about the plot? Think about, once you've read this play, what happens, what is the central conflict that causes all the problems in this plot, and is it, in, in fact, nothing? And might we say, to extend that, aren't all fictional plots making something out of nothing? There are also a couple of puns hidden in Shakespeare's title that we don't get because of the way in which pronunciation has changed and the way in which certain slang terms have changed. The first pun is that nothing in Shakespeare's time was pronounced closer to the word noting. They wouldn't have pronounced that th sound. So noting or making note or noticing. Who is noted in this play and what are they noted for? Who makes notes on other people? Who makes notes on each other? Or what sorts of note making is there in this play? Who or what is noteworthy? What is worth being noticed, worth being paid attention to? Notice that this makes us really focus on the act of looking, how people look at each other, and that looking is not just a value-free passive action. When you look at something, you are marking it, you are noting it, you are taking note of it in a certain way. And depending on your relative power, your status, your gender, you are going to be noted and be able to make note of others in different ways. So someone who's of high status can note others in a very particular way, in a way that someone of low status can't note someone else. The other pun in Shakespeare's title seems a bit crude at first, but it is actually very important to the ideas in this play and the relationships. Nothing in Shakespeare's time also was a sexual term. It was a word of sexual slang. It was a euphemism for female genitalia. And the logic here is sort of obvious. I'm not going to spell it out too much, but just say a woman's nothing is compared to a man's thing. And so it's a man's thing that is added to the woman's nothing, and that's what produces children. Um, and it's a very obvious binary sort of thinking and a certainly misogynist sort of thinking in that it equates women with nothingness, whereas men are the ones that have substance. So this, of course, is also a comment on the plot. What is it that upsets Claudio? What is it that Claudio is so concerned with? Heroes, nothing. That is what the men in this, pow, in this play are consistently anxious about, their sexual power versus women's sexual power. So quite literally, a woman's nothing, which is, of course, a thing, is at the center of this play. There's much ado, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiety over women's bodies. So some questions we might ask just after thinking about the title. What mood or atmosphere does this create for us? What expectations does it set? Presume that you get all these puns as soon as you see the title, as definitely most of Shakespeare's audience would. What would that help you expect? How does the title relate to the plot? How does the title foreshadow the plot? And does the title in some way comment on the plot or the characters in? 
Does it make us, does it lead us to any judgment, moral or ethical or otherwise, about the characters, what motivates them, what they end up doing, and so forth? And then think about what issues, themes, problems does it establish? Some that I've already talked about, problems, issues like masculine anxiety, sexual power. What other things are established by this title that we are going to want to pay attention to in our reading of the play? Let's look at the characters. So first we have the noble soldiers as one important group of characters. Don Pedro, who is the highest ranking character in the play, his friend Benedict, and his other friend Claudio, his two associates who are lower in status, but like him, noble soldiers. So we might think to ourselves or ask ourselves, first off, where are they coming from? Why are they coming into this play? What have they been doing before the beginning of this play? Um, what defines them as characters? What are their essential traits, motivations, desires? What do they say about themselves? How do they define themselves? How do other characters look at them? And then finally, how do they relate to each other? And by that I mean these are three men, three close friends. How do they behave towards each other? What do they seem to feel to each other? What do they say to each other? How do they joke around and so forth? And what does that reveal about their personalities? We then have the people of Messina, Messina being the town in which this all takes place. They're led by Leonardo. He's the, the senior official in Messina, although lower in rank to Don Pedro. His daughter, Hero, his niece, Beatrice, his brother, Antonio. There's Friar Francis, and then there's various other characters, the female maids and so forth. Uh, so we might think to ourselves, what is their situation? How is their situation different from the noble soldiers? How are they different from the noble soldiers? In particular, think about the men, Leonato, Antonio, and Friar Francis, in contrast to Don Pedro, Benedict, and Claudio. What differentiates them in terms of age, in terms of their marital or sexual status, in terms of their uh, profession? And then thematically, how does that differentiate between the world from which the noble soldiers are coming from and this world of Messina that they are entering? Now we have the villains. First, Don John, who is the bastard brother of Don Pedro, and his two associates, Boraccio and Conrad. Boraccio, obviously, being related to drunkenness. So... What motivates these characters? What motivates the villains? Don John in particular, as he's the central villain, why is he a villain? What does he say about himself? What makes him do the things he wants to do? And then how do they actually work in the play? What is it that they do? Why are they successful, at least at first, in their villainous plans? What is What are the anxieties or confusions of the other characters that the villains take advantage of. So think about what is it that motivates them and what do they do? What motivations or desires or secrets of the other characters do they play upon? Finally, last but not least, we have the clowns. Dogberry at the head, his associate Virgis, and the various others who work uh, with them in the town watch. Uh, as I've said before, Dogberry is one of the most purely stupid of Shakespeare's clowns. That's not to say he's not entertaining or important, but just his character seems to be one of the most dense. Uh, what do the clowns want? What does Dogberry want in life? What would make him happy? What does he hope to accomplish? Same thing with Verges. In a way, they're almost, they're, they're, they're very sort of difficult even to differentiate. They're sort of like two halves of the same stupid person. And how important are they to the plot? Are they just comic relief or do they serve an important function in what happens? And what does that tell us about their difference from the noble characters, the so-called higher characters who are supposedly more intelligent? What ironic commentaries might Shakespeare be making about the foolishness of both sides or, or of all levels of the society. What makes 
the non-clown characters clown-like in their own right. The last thing I'll talk about in this first lecture, just to sum up some relationships and key ideas. So think about male friendship, but also friendly rivalry. The three male heroes, the three noble soldiers, they are soldiers, right? So there's they're friends, they have a close relationship, but to what extent does rivalry intrude upon that friendship, or in some sense, does rivalry actually form the basis of that friendship in some sense? There's an important romance relationship between Claudio and Hero. That's the central romance of the play, and it is paralleled by the merry war of the sexes that we see between Beatrice and Benedict. So we might think about those two sets of relationships, those two pairs, and compare what is the relationship between Claudio and Hero like? What is it founded upon? How is it different from that relationship between Beatrice and Benedict? Or in, what do the relationships have in common? Another important relationship, rivalry and hatred. So instead of rivalry being a part of friendship, we have rivalry and hatred between the two half-brothers, Don Pedro and Don John. And finally, think about the relationship that is created with class status, the nobles and the clowns, or perhaps we might say the nobles versus the clowns. What are the dividing lines between these classes? What are the things that connect them? So these, these are all just some initial ideas to think about as you uh, understand the characters and how they interact with one another.